Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, hi there. Hi there. Fred, you got sort of slightly Laurel and Hardy this morning. Are you okay? So, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you and um, your society. Um, we're here to talk <clears> about <throat> research we've been doing into the civil war defences of London. Um, the, as you may know, that the civil war defences of London have been a problem for at least 50 years as to where are they in the past. Both Mike and I have spent quite a lot of fruitless time digging holes in East London trying to find these things. And the long and short it was that the map, which you can see there in black showing the predicted lines, is based on a map by a chap called George Virtue, produced in 1738, which is a forgery. He claimed it was based on earlier documents, and I'm afraid he wasn't telling the truth. He made it up, possibly for financial gain. He was an engraver by trade, and presumably there was a market for these things. So we were asked, um, or commissioned, I should say, by Historic England to look at study area one, because we discovered a big discrepancy. And once we started looking at it, it became then a larger project. That, which that's, is that's the yellow area to the right, to the east. Yeah. Um, so then we moved on to study area two, then we were going to move on to three and four, we moved on to five because Southwark and Lambeth Archaeological Excavation Committee very, very kindly came forward um, to offer a joint fund with Historic England, the South, Southern Reaches, so that's what we've done. So that's why it's five, so it's one, two and five and three and four for the future possibly. So next slide please. This is, this is the villainous virtue map, um, he didn't just say I based on something he faked it up he's pretended to be older than it is it's not real it's misled everybody he missed he had he had serial form on us he mis mis so it's a fake it's a fake I mean, next Mike's, Mike's telling me to shut up yeah, yeah okay on, next. next one next slide please okay what we have found is more interesting documentation which hasn't been found before on the right hand side you've got DeWitt's map now you may be able to sharp eyed enough to see there's a very faint pencil line around the buildings shown for London on the north bank. In the um, open ground. On the open ground. And I've been trying to get a decent copy from British Library since April, but I'm still working on it. On the left, we have got a list of forts where soldiers were being paid, which we kindly was brought to our attention by David Flinton, who's the leading military expert on these matters, who had been approached by a chap called Ivor Carr, who'd come across when he was researching something about the Staffordshire regiments. Next slide, please. OK, uh, this is a LIDAR map of the topography of the study areas. They're the three study areas, the river. Thames wiggles this blue line wiggling through it. On the north side, the darker green colours show the later gravel terraces going up the side of the Thames Valley. These are slightly higher than the brown uh, gravels to the south. So to the north, you've got the Hackney gravel and the Lynch Hill gravel reaching an elevation of between 15 and 25 metres OD, going as high as 38 metres to the far north. Uh, these gravels were fairly dry and nice to work with, so the military engineers in the mid-17th century had reasonably good soils to work with. Alternatively, on the south side, where you're get, getting into Southwark, those, that brown area, that's floodplain gravel, that's Kempton Park gravel, that's round about zero OD with a cap of brick earth bringing it up another metre or two, but it's low-lying ground and it's, it, it's prone to flooding uh, so it's very waterlogged ground, so it's more difficult for the military engineers to work and put defensive lines in Southwark than it is north of the river. OK, can we have the next slide, please? OK, let's start with the forts. Whopping. That's the blue circle, well, bottom, yeah. sort of on the right-hand side. The description by a chap called William Lifkoe has been absolutely critical. He walked around these lines of communication, as they're called, and the forts um, in 1643, April and May. And his description has been absolutely crucial, trying to work out where these forts are. But he found the fort there, and he said it's in the midst of the houses. Um, if you look at the DeWitt map to the side, you can see the pencil line. I've slightly stressed it out now to um, show, but you can see it leads down to the, it was described by Lufko, the fort was in the midst of the houses. Next slide, please. OK, this is uh, Wapping Fort. We have Wapping High Street in the foreground, Wapping Dock Street going northwards up there. Um, then we have Dexter's the shop right in front of you. Now, behind that shop, there's an open area where the East London Line extension put in two vent shafts about four metres in diameter. And these vent shafts came across cut features dating to the 17th century 
with a good date range hitting the mid 17th century. So these features were dated to the Civil War period. Uh, in one vent chaff, we found two uh, alluvial filled ditches, but one of them had an oak plank revetment, which is very interesting to us. Uh, the other vent shaft had a brick floor and a brick wall. The floor was dated to 1640 to 1660, and the bricks used in the building uh, were dated between 1550 and the Great Fire 1666. So again, they are in the date range for the Civil War period. But the reason why we took this photograph is if you look at um, the road going northwards there, you can see there, with the eye of faith, there is a very low hump. It humps up in the foreground, flattens off, and then towards that blue car right at the back, it sort of drops down a little bit. We think that might be the residual deposits left from the slighting of some kind of artillery platform, which would have belonged to the fort behind Dexter's uh, buildings. So we think this supports our, our contention that the fort was, was located in this area. Um, next slide, please, Tim. Right, on to Whitechapel. Um, as you can see in the DeWitt plan, we're circled there. This is sort of squiggle for the fort itself. Um, these forts were never properly mapped at the time, as far <coughs> as we know. Um, and the maps that were made during the late 17th century, for a variety of reasons, ignored them as far as possible. But occasionally, elements can slip through. Next slide, please. So that um, Faithful and Newcourt, their well known map 1658. If you look in detail around that windmill, you can see the remains of the bastion of Whitechapel Fort, and it's also documented from the zigzag thing. The zigzag thing on, on either side of the windmill itself. Um, so we know it's precisely there. It was this confusion that led to big problems with virtue because he thought the Whitechapel Fort was where the Royal London Hospital is, which is a quarter of a mile away to the to the east. Next slide, please. And this is what that ziggy zaggy thing looks like today. Left hand slide in the foreground is Whitechapel High Street. Going down on the left hand slide of the slide is Plumbers Row. And in the corner, there is what's known as the, the Whitechapel Bell Foundry. Um, 18th century, so it's very old. But if you look very closely along the line of the base of that wall, you will see a zigzag. The right hand slide. Uh, oh, in fact, we're in the way of it, but no, the, no, no. the right hand slide uh, is a zigzag as well. So that strange uh, property boundary, we think echoes what would have been the outline of one of the bastions for the, the Whitechapel fort. Um, next slide, please. Right, on to the Royal London Hospital site. Um, this is a major fort and it was sort of, this was the confusing one, so, so it was a virtue map. Next slide. One of the reasons we identify where it was is we got this wonderful hollow panorama. Um, now, if you look carefully on the right-hand side, near the Tower of London, there you can see a windmill. If we zero in on the next slide, you can see there is a very large isolated fort with a substantial building in the middle and a flag. Now, that is a Civil War fort, but it's not mentioned in the documentary sources until 1647. Now, 1647, Thomas Fairfax, the head of the New Model Army, invaded London. And part of what he did, according to the Venetian ambassador, was build citadels to bridle London. And I think there is a possibility that this is one of those um, very substantial, and it's away from the general uh, sort of circle of the defences. So this isn't part of that line. It's, a, it's something else and something strange instead. Next slide, please. And here we have a couple of Old maps, Roke, 1746, so this is mid 18th century, 100 years after the uh, Civil War. But what you can see on Roke's map uh, and then uh, on the other maps, Chantelaine, is the great big mound that may well have been the uh, artillery platform. Um, this is 100 years later, obviously. It's been slighted, it's been denuded, there are trees on the top of it, and so on and so forth. Um, if we can have a look at the, the, the next slide. Now, what if you look at the top left hand slide, in the foreground, you have Whitechapel Road. Going off to the south, uh, where that traffic light is, you have New Road. Then the terrace houses at the back, that is Mount Terrace. Um, they were built in 1819, following a petition in 1805 to slight the mound. Um, and as usual, they did slight the mound, but they left a residual 
area that was, was still not properly cleared and was about a metre higher. And if you look at the right hand slide, you will see a car park in the mid ground. Uh, and then in the foreground, you'll see the bicycles on the pavement. And you, you will be able to notice there's a difference of about a metre uh, depth between those two um, land surfaces. And that metre is um, the remains of the Whitechapel Citadel Mound. Um, we've done extensive excavations for the, the, the Royal Hospital in this area, and they have found many features that could be dated to the mid 17th century. Some of them are linear cuts as well, some of them are pits. The problem is that these linear cuts um, seem to be drainage ditches and not defensive features, uh, mainly because they've been open for a long period of time and the Civil War uh, features would have been backfilled fairly rapidly. Um, also, this area was very, very extensively quarried for gravel and brick earth, and so the archaeological stratigraphy is quite heavily fragmented, so it's very difficult to interpret with any, any degree of confidence what is actually going on. So we're not sure if we've got any fort stuff here, archaeologically speaking, but certainly the ground levels are there. Uh, can we have the next slide, Tim? Okay. Very simple one, Brick Lane. It's mentioned by the city orders in February 1643 to be constructed. Lisco doesn't mention it when he's walking past, but it clearly was a little bit of a fault because archaeology found some. Mike? Yeah, 2007, Museum of London did some archaeological excavations here when they built the new railway bridge. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the brick earth, the natural drift geology, the brick earth was overlain. It was sealed by a fairly thick deposit of plough soil. The plough soil was dated 1630 to 1650, so that's bang on target for our date range. Um, and the most striking feature, there were two, two cut features were cut into, two double ditches were, were, were cut into this plough soil. And the thing about the double ditches, as we, we'll tell you later on as we, we, we go through, is that they are, seem to be a characteristic of Civil War defensive features, not of the main forts, but of uh, smaller scale redoubts that seem to fringe the periphery of the main forts and also seem to flank the major arterial routes in and out of London. Papillon, who was uh, a, a, mili a military um, engineer at the time in a manual dated 1645, uh, does a contemporary view of the, of the defences and he says of the Civil War defences, your great ditch being 20 foot broad is far safer than these small double ditches having a bank of earth some two feet broad left between them, used and erected about the London redoubts. So here's a direct uh, documentary reference to this double ditch defensive uh, characteristic of some of the smaller redoubts around uh, the defensive circuit. Um, next slide. Yeah, that's please. Okay, uh, Shoreditch, can't really say very much about it. It's, it's, see, it's on the little map there of DeWitt. Um, it's not where virtually put it, he put it south of the church. That and Hoxton, next slide, please. Um, flank the road. Hoxton, a bit more interesting. Um, it's a, we know from uh, Lithgow's description, it was quite a substantial one. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, and, and these are the, the 18th century maps showing uh, this area of Hoxton. Hoxton Square is just to the west of that of our red circle study area, if you like. The main road, Ermine Street, going north to Lincoln and York, uh, later the A10 Kingsland Road, is on the right-hand side of to the east of the circle. And there's a gap between, between the houses fronting onto Kingsland Road. There's a gap at the back, these gardens. And this is kind of good news for the archaeology because it means it survives more intact. Uh, so as a result of that, uh, the Museum of London were able to carry out a couple of excavations on Drysdale Street and in one excavation they uh, excavated a number of pits dated by uh, clay pipe uh, to between 1640 and 1660. Clay pipe's good news because you can get, I am told, I'm not a fine specialist, you can get slightly um, more accurate dating from clay pipes. There's also a brick wall cellar with a gravel floor and a brick type uh, dated to the 1600s. Then again, and this is the this is the important bit, two parallel ditches or two double ditches are, were recorded uh, at 7 to 27 Drysdale Street. Uh, and they, one of these was dated to the mid 17th century. And there was also a pit close by that was dated 1630 to 1650. So again, we've got these double ditches. Now, the, the nice thing about this is that we've got them flanking one of the major arterial routes going in and out of London. Um, so could this be the Hoxton Redoubt? 
could the double digits have been these flimsy defences that Papillon was saying were pretty useless? Um, we think they probably are. Uh, next slide, please, Tim. Okay, on to Mount Mill. This is a curious history of this site. Um, there is a great mound, as you can see on the Agus map, there in the 16th century, a rubbish heap. Basically, London has always had a problem with its garbage. And so the simplest thing, you take it up the road and dump it, and you keep dumping it in the same place, you end up with a big hill. In this particular case, as you can see from Agus, there was a windmill on it. The windmill blew down. Subsequently, a chapel was built on it. That was demolished. And then another windmill was built on top of it. And then the Civil War happened and the windmill and hill were requisitioned, next slide please, to build a fort. So unusually, we have another picture of it, as you can see from a cartoon here, showing the windmill without its sails, uh, very ferocious looking sets of very spikes and cannons sticking out and a curious set of uh, outer defenses, somewhat like a sort of medieval castle and Motton Bailey, and you can see on the left hand side there, just above the word mount, is a small redoubt which is lies in the area of what is now Sebastian Street. Beyond that, you can see there's a circular fort, which we'll come to in a moment, which is a separate fort altogether. Um, this was a very important fort, and because of the nature of the area, it's because it's been redevelopment, archaeological work has taken place. Next slide, please. So, this is on Sebastian Street where that redoubt was, and in 20. 1617 uh, City University's new law faculty buildings were to be built there so they had to dig a great big hole and the Archaeological Museum of London went in to do the archaeological excavations uh, and this photograph shows you the double ditches that were recorded during that excavation. Um, the darker material obviously is the ditch fill and the brown, lighter brown stuff is brick earth that the ditches are cut into. Um, interestingly if you look at the back of that photograph the section there has got the orange and black stuff uh, that is uh, great fire of london um, material that's been dumped in a cut uh, on top of the ditches uh, so that that gives you a date that's sealing so that's dated 1666 and it's sealing uh, these two uh, ditches uh, next slide please and uh, this is a section through one of those ditches the scale at the back is a half meter scale <clears throat> and it's sitting on top of the brick earth that the ditch is cut into. So to the left and right of this slide, you can see the dark silty material is the ditch fill. And the other side of the ditch is where the photograph has been taken from. At the bottom of that ditch, uh, that is oak planking. It's been ID'd by the Museum of London as oak. We think that oak planking may have revetted the side of the ditch and it then collapsed, but we're not entirely sure. But this what you are looking at there is one of these not very effective, useless double ditches that Papillon was referring to. Uh, next slide, please. Right, we're now moving up to um, the new river head, where so this is the fort shown in the corner of that cartoon. Basically, in 1613, um, a, a reservoir was built for the new river, which brought a sort of a, it was literally an aqueduct to bring water from Hertfordshire uh, to London. And at the end of it, they built this enormous 200 foot circular tank. Um, and that then became, provided two reasons for civil war defences to include it. One was it's a strategic asset, clearly it's providing water for the city, but also it was such a large structure on the halfway up a hill, it provided a very, very good defensive vantage point. So it was enhanced, next slide please, as you, here we got back to the holler again. There is actually a, a view of it of beyond, if you can see St Paul's there on the left, at the back of that, if we go into detail, next slide please. You can see there it is with the water tower and the circular wall around it. And above it, there is another structure which we'll come to in a moment. Next slide please. And you can see another holler drawing here on the left. There's a timber palisade protecting an area and you can see that is a bastion that's shown on Morgan's map of 1682, a sort of diamond shaped bastion sticking out from the circular um, New River Pond itself. Um, and so that would have provided protection for the troops. Uh, curiously, it is pointing southwards and there is a decided ambiguity about the nature of these defences. And the Venetian ambassador made the point that they seem as much to control London as to deter the king from attacking. So that it had this duality of role, which was not purely defensive, it was also oppressive one way or another. And that comes out in several other forts. Next slide, please. 
And unusually, part of it is still visible, as you thanks to Google, um, you can see that the circular tank has still partially survived. It was rebuilt on numerous occasions, but that is the outline of the Civil War fort as it stood. So if you had to be on your way to Saddles Well, which is the building at the very top, the little pointy building on the right hand side at the top, and peer through the gate, you will be able to see part of the Civil War defences, which is reasonably unusual. Next slide, please. Right, on to the Angel Fort, which was another one of these big standalone forts, even higher up than the, the New River Head. And you can see it's on the DeWitt map as a very substantial quadrate fort. Next slide, please. And there's another detail, a sharp eye of you might have noticed on the previous with the New River Head, as you can see, a very substantial fort with a central building and a flag. Um, very, very impressive. Given the cannon range at that point was about a mile from there, you could bombard St Paul's. So that was a key position. It obviously couldn't be allowed to fall into the hands of the king, but equally anybody in London looking northwards would be very, very simply reminded of where the power lay, and that was with the military. Uh, next slide, please. And this is Pentonville Road in the foreground, looking southwards, you can see St. Paul's, you can see the circular river head on the left hand slide uh, area there. So this is a nice artillery position for a gunner. Um, but what we're looking at is the reservoir in the foreground. And if you look just to the right, to the west of the, uh, of the reservoir, which uh, was previously the fort, you'll see a mound of upcast there. If you look at Walpool, uh, the picture on the right hand side, uh, you'll see that that mound has disappeared. You will also see that there are two brick kilns nearby. And this sort of, this turn, this popped up in a conversation with David Flinton, where we were all having one afternoon. Um, and it, it, it appears that the upcast from the digging of the defences would, and the upcast was mainly composed of brick earth. Brick earth's great for making bricks, especially dirty brick earth. It, because they bond harder when they're dirty, and that's exactly what you get from the upcast of a defensive cut. Um, so what's happened here, we think, is that that brick earth has been used and they've actually built the brick kiln by the defences. So in future, what we're going to do is keep an eye on the location of these brick kilns to see if there's any association with the two. Um, next slide, please. Grazing Lane, a small fort mentioned um, to and fro. I mean, the <clears throat> Lisco calls it the Pinch of Wakefield Fort because there was a pub nearby. We went to several pubs. A lot of the forts were actually named. It refers to them by just next to the Red Bull, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, only a small fort. We can't say much to the documentary side. Papillon mentions it in passing. Again, the double ditches and how rubbish the defences were around things like that. And it was a ridiculously small and no use at all as a fort. So Papillon didn't like the defences very much. But equally, it should be said he didn't get any of the jobs to build any of them. So he had a slightly vested interest. Um, next slide, please. OK, so this is, again, mid 18th century, 100 years after the Civil War. And what it is showing you is the topography of the Fleet Valley just a little bit north and west of Farringdon Road. So Grazing Road is the main road to the west, to the, to the left of the stream you can see. Um, it's not a particularly big stream, but it's fast flowing. The actual valley it, it uh, inhabits is fairly deep. It goes down from 20 metres OD to about 12, 14 metres OD. So there's between five and eight metres drop from the, from the valley sides down to the very bottom. Uh, we're not sure at the moment how the Civil War engineers coped with this particular, this, this topographical feature. Um, certainly this is the last sort of cartographic evidence you have of the real topography. It was then in the 18th, 19th century, backfilled with huge amounts of dumped material, a lot of it uh, de demolition waste, domestic waste. The problem with this dumped material is that it contains uh, dating evidence from earlier periods, so the dating has become very difficult for this area. There's also a number of uh, gravel quarries in this area which have chopped up the archaeology, fragmented it. And Mola and um, Archaeology Southeast have done a number of excavations in here and found some interesting features, um, although we're not exactly sure how to interpret them at the moment. Uh, can we have the, the next slide? And here it is today. 
So you've got Grazing Road over on the left, marked, and the River Fleet's obviously the blue dotted line, and then the defences are in red. Uh, and you can just see, we've, we've shown where the defences hit the, the Fleet Valley, it, it, it dips a little bit to give it some, some sort of artistic inter in interpretation, but that's, that's the general location. You've got Findon Road, the main road, going a little bit to the right, and that's Mount Pleasant uh, Post Office there. Okay, I think next slide, please. And we're now at Southampton House. Um, as you can see, this was a very impressive pair of bastions put onto the pre-existing garden of um, Lord Southampton's house. Looks like it was designed by a proper military engineer. I mean, there's sort of not many of these forts look like that. The most of them look like they were kind of like built or designed by people who weren't that familiar with the details of modern technology, this stuff. Um, next slide, please. What is unusual on this one is we've got two 17th century maps, which I've overlaid here. So we've got the fort and the lines of communication, which is extremely rare. It was on a property and there was disputes about who owned what, what damage had been done. And as you can see, the sort of lines are shown as that three lines parallel, which then zigzags. And that zigzag is round and ponding from the stream, which you can see is flowing further along to the, to the left right hand side. We've not really talked about the lines of communication because we haven't got time, but yeah. they, they, they were basically, we, we assume, a, um, a trench and a rampart in order to facilitate troop movement between forts. Yeah. I mean, the standard military term is that lines of communication is, it's not a defensive ditch with a bank, it's a trench with a parapet, um, sort of more First World War, if for moving troops from one place to another with comparative safety. Right, that's pretty much North London. Next slide. Thank you. So just in summary, you can see there how different the black lines and red lines are. Red line is where we found out the stuff really is. So that is where we are at the moment. What we're going to do now is cross the river into the beautiful county of Surrey. In the next slide. And you can see there, study area five is the funny looking sort of sausagey thing on the south coast running from Vauxhall to Rotherhithe. And there'll be similar, we'll have rings around it, various pots so you can see um, where we are, if you're not that familiar with the um, roads and such like of South London. Next slide, please. All right, here's the LIDAR picture again. Um, we've got the beige coloured stuff, low line, Kempton Park gravel, Brick Earth Cap. Um, th there, are th there are three watercourses in our area. We've got the Ephra at the western end, the Neckinger flowing sort of east west across the middle, and then the Earl's Sluice on the right hand side, but they're fairly small watercourses. Um, so we're not entirely sure how much influence they would have had on strategic defences of London, but you can see where the red line of the study area is going and the Civil War defences are in the middle of that study area. So we're going to start with Vauxhall on the western side. Yeah. And the next slide, then we see just to sort of give an idea of how wet this is from so, the blue bits I coloured yeah. in. <laughs> Peter coloured all the blue bits in. This is Roke's map. It is 100 years after the Civil War, but what it does show is the complexity and the... And, uh, and, and the, the numerous cut features, ditches and dikes that have been employed to drain this area. Um, a hundred years earlier, there wouldn't have been so many of them, but it was, you know, it has been known to be in a, a, a marshland area um, for years and years. And years. Um, ne next slide. Right, we start with Vauxhall. Um, that was a, a fort described by Lithgow. It's the very much there. It's opposite. There's another one on the other side of Tothill Fields, as it was there. I mean, clearly, at both ends of the Thames, you had to have forts either side to protect against shipping coming down and troops being landed either side. Uh, next slide. We don't have a decent map, um, like a sort of DeWitt. He doesn't have anything for South London. But what we do have is this miniature map by Holler, which is surprisingly informative considering how small it is and you can see that little blob there is uh, Vauxhall and immediately to its left right on the river bank there is possibly a, a blockhouse certainly some sort of fortification and you can see the lines running up to the northeast to the next fort which is St George's next slide please we do have a sort of fairly good map of it from the early 18th century before it was getting too eroded by this <coughs> chap, a chap called Desmarets um, next slide please it was sufficiently substantial, even into the early 19th century, as you can see, the southwest bastion was still being used as a property boundary. So um, it, it did work. Uh, next slide, please. This is the railway viaduct over Kennington Lane, heading north towards Waterloo Station. Uh, just very quickly, the reason why we've put this on here is that the fort lies somewhere bang underneath the viaduct. But the good news is that these viaducts tended to be supported on stanchions. 
Uh, and in between the stanchions, you can get reasonably good archaeological survival. So we think there may be some Civil War defensive uh, structures surviving in this area. That's all we want to say. Could you do us the next slide, Tim? OK. OK, Lambeth, but it's mentioned by Lisco. Nobody else. Um, it was probably just a small fortification, but next slide, please. Black Prince Road, that green stuff on the left that is probably where the fort was. So we may have some survival in this area. The fort was slap bang in the middle of Black Prince Road. Black Prince Road connects eventually with Blackman Street, which heads up to the southern bridgehead of London Bridge. Um, so it's strategically quite a useful route. Um, there may be some survival here as well. Uh, next slide, please. All right, St George's Fort, which is right by the Imperial War Museum. Um, this was a very, very large fort, part of this double-edged thing of being defence and oppression, um, because at the height of it, if you came out of the door of Westminster Palace as an MP onto your little boat to go into the city, you would have seen this thing on the other side of a river standing 30, 40 feet high. It would have been very, very clear where power lay with this very, very large fort. Next slide, please. We've got to have Roke, you might have traces of the defensive ditches that raid them, uh, lay around this quadrate fort. And I've put in in red roughly where you could get a fort into it. Um, so you can see it's substantial. In the middle, there is a building which may be one of the buildings shown, say, on Holler, of the substantial brick buildings that stood inside these forts. So there's um, barracks and armories and the rest of it. And it was then turned into a pub. Next slide, please. This is the western side of the Imperial War Museum, where the Museum of London undertook a watching brief when the floor slab was broken out uh, and surface trenches were, were, were excavated. The interesting thing here are the double ditches you can see to the north end of those surface trenches. Um, and yet, yet again, we have double ditches. So the important thing is that these are a characteristic of Civil War defences, and, and in this case, for one of those double ditches, the dating evidence was pretty good, putting it into the mid 17th century. There wasn't any dating for the other one, but by association, they both seem to respect each other. So we, we are looking at them as a pair of, uh, of double ditches. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Lambeth Road. Um, on the right, you've got the, the, the open green areas. And the reason for this slide is that um, we think this area would, we could employ um, penetrating radar, geotechnical survey work, um, we could undertake in these areas because they're fairly open. We don't think there's too much background noise here with there won't have been chopped about much. So we might be able to find uh, some outlines of civil war defences in these open and green areas. Uh, next, next slide. Right, Newington Butts, which is also gave its name as the, to the Elephant and Castle, which is a corruption of Oliver's Castle. Um, elephant and olivant occur elsewhere in London as well. Um, very critical point for controlling where various roads were coming together. Uh, next slide, please. You see on the redoubtable hollow map, this little blob there, that's where the fort was. Behind it and running from St George's sort of to the bottom of Southwark, there was actually what appears to be a causeway. Next slide, please which is shown on a hollow map, very thin line, you can see there, and it's also on Roke, and it's mentioned by Defoe when he was describing South London. And it's almost like there was a road built just north of the Newington Butts Fort sideways to service the fort at St George's. And unusually, next slide please, we have also got what appears to be the only depiction of one of the checkpoints um, around London. This is from Faith on New Court, and you say it's very it's significant, you know, trapped the traffic and he could check people for what was moving in and out. Next slide, please. The um, 17th century, the civil war defences were very pointedly ignored for all sorts of political reasons apart from anything else. Um, this was commissioned by um, Canterbury Cathedral, shown their lands. In the middle there is a building which is the white horse, which became the elephant and castle. And you can see it's got its tavern sign. You see this little sticky out sign. And then just below that, there's a gap between the houses, which I think is where one side of the fort would be. It was bastions on the other side of the road. And there would have been a bastion on the other side of the road. And I don't think it's an accident in the middle there. If you can see, there's a thing marked Maypole, a little upright thing. And I think that's quite deliberate assertion of the good times are back and the miserable piety of Cromwell and his mates is gone. 
that's my view of it anyway. It's just a personal take on that one. Next slide, please. Okay, this is uh, Elephant Castle. Uh, just to show you the post-war uh, development of the area, um, there are, however, spots in between these, the, these particular buildings that uh, survival may take place. Um, this post-war development has also restricted to a certain extent the number of intervent archaeological interventions in this particular locale. But if we can have the next slide, please. Uh, this is done by place services and it's showing you uh, basically different levels of potential archaeological survival. Obviously the red areas are uh, not very really good, but you see there's plenty of green areas around there where if development in the future takes place, it would be good for us to do some uh, archaeological evaluation work to check out and see if we can find any civil war features in this area. So potentially there's still work to be done here. Uh, next slide, please. Right, off to Kent Street, otherwise also called the Lock Fort. Um, next slide, show Mount Hollow, we've got, there is a quite clear one. Uh, next slide, this was by the Lock Hospital, which was a hospital for venereal diseases, previously a leper hospital. Um, Morgan carefully tries to not show much on his map, but in the very edge, going into the border of the map, there is a sort of L-shaped water-filled feature, and on Roke, there is a funny zigzag bit on the property boundary for the Lock Hospital, and if you put the two together, you actually end up with a bastion shape, which I've coloured yellow, um, with blue water out, and I'm pretty sure that is the location of the bastion for the hospital, for the, for the fort just south of the hospital. Next slide. And this is its location today, Great Dover Street, Tabard Street there, um, where that purple thing is in the middle of the slide for newspapers or something, or was it re recycling? Where that is, is, is pretty much where the fort is. But again, just very quickly, we think there will be some decent survival in this area um, outside the building footprints. So potentially could be some archeology span in this, in this area. Okay. Okay, next. Next slide, please. We're nearly there. Nearly there, Bermondsey, right? A big fort um, just near Bermondsey Abbey, near the Grange. It's sometimes called Grange Fort. Next slide, please. Um, Hollow did a sketch before he did his panorama, and he didn't include all of it in the final finished product. But if you look, there, with the eye of faith, there may be the outline of a fort, and that's why I put the two in. Equally, it may just be him shading in stuff. So I'm not saying that's definite. It's just a um, personal thing. Well, that's quite interesting. Next slide, please. This field with the red circle in it was called Fort Field. Um, it's seven acres. The Cecil family who owned the land got lots of compensation for it. It was a very big fort. It took a lot of time and effort to demolish it. Um, we do know that in the process of this, there were 200 elm trees chopped down, about 200 acres of pasture lost its fencing, and it's possible that that timber was used to construct effectively a corduroy road across the marshy deposits to form the lines over to the next fort at Rotherhithe, which was all very much soggy water meadow. If you tried to dig a trench, it would turn into a canal. So clearly they had a different way of having the lines of communication at that point. Next slide, please. Okay, this is where we think uh, it is, the municipal building there, the big white building, Spa Road, Neckinger Road. Uh, I, I, again, we're just putting this in to show you what it looks like in the present day and that there is potential for archaeological survival in the open areas around the main big white building there. Okay, let's do the next one. Next slide. Please. There we go. There we are, opposite Wapping. We've got Robert Hive. Next slide. Um, funny looking business. This on Faith on New Court looks like a fortified quayside, which is unlike the other forts with two sort of substantial buildings on either side of it. The lane leading up to that oval is called Elephant Lane and still called Elephant Lane, which is a corruption of Oliver's Lane. And that goes back to the 1650s as the name. So I think this gives an indication of where this was leading to. Next slide, please. And you can see there more clearly somebody, you know, has drawn it with crenellations on the adjoining buildings as well. So it's a fairly substantial piece of something on the quay side. And it would have been presumably a bit like looking at Portsmouth Harbour, you get where you can have cannons facing onto the sea so that on this case, in the river, so ships are, can be controlled. Next slide, please. And if we look at the slide on the left, um, you can see a hundred yards to the east of the Rotherhide Fort, there is a red square saying where the East London line 
extensions vent shafts were located this time on the south side of the river remember we all looked at some on at Wapping here on the south side of the river there are two vent shafts for about four meters in diameter shaft one and shaft two they both contained uh, evidence for the riverfront revetments were produced from vertical oak piles with um, soft wood uh, walling um, of reused river vessel wood basically shaft one was dated sort of 1650 1750 shaft two round about mid 17th century so it looks like there's generally speaking there's a mid 17th century um, up, improvement of the waterfront in that period close to where we think the lines of commu communication may have um, reached the Thames okay next slide please it's just the view that it would be more broadly between that large modern white building on the riverfront and the church tower. That's where they've been pretty full. So it's kind of long and thin. Next slide, please. So in summary, it's central, central London. This is the defences. And as you can see, that pretty much none of it matches with the previous stuff. Obviously, there's a large gap on the west. Um, uh, next slide, please, and just put it into a general context. There are lots of small forts, which you've also been looking at, which we don't have time to talk about. So you can see it was part of a very complex, in-depth <clears throat> defensive structure. Um, in terms of, was it a symbol of power? It was a symbol and an assertion and also practical. Um, it was very much, this was there to do the hard work of defending the city, as well as impressing on everybody, we are not going anywhere. Parliament is going to hold on to London. Anyway, I think we're there. So thank you for your time.